This debate does not happen in any ordinary combat situation. Rather, we think it takes place in two instances. Firstly, when soldiers are considered to have fallen out of the combat in, in showing that they are now incapable of pursuing active combat in situations where they are most likely to be captured. And we think this is when it's nearing the end of combat or when they're in the proximity of terrorist organizations, which makes them most vulnerable to the powers of terrorist groups. But it also happens in situations where the survivability of a soldier is at its least um, it is at the lowest probability. And I think that there are great costs that will come about when a person is made to live rather than to initiate the Hannibal Directive when they're dealing with terrorist organizations. When will our policy take place? Firstly, we think it will take place the moment you as a soldier have lost all control or have been isolated by your, um, your other army so soldiers or in positions when you are now you have now infiltrated terrorist organizations and do not have the power to control the outcomes that will befall upon you we think at this point if you have other individual soldiers with you you would then take necessary steps to terminate the life of the other soldiers or if you are the sole soldier in that situation you may consume a cyanide pill to kill yourself we think there are many situations where this has already taken place if we look at the Mossad regime in Israel Many soldiers will need to terminate their lives the moment they've been put in a very vulnerable position where military secrets are most likely to be made known to these terrorist organizations. Yeah, yeah. But firstly, we need to ask ourselves, what are military secrets and why do they have such a great value within this debate? We think military secrets could come in a variety of forms. Firstly, it may disclose information about other uh, military tactics within that a government may be take, may put place in a during a certain conflict or intervention. It can also reveal particular information on the demographics of the people in your country or positions of satellites in your nation. We think the moment terrorist organizations take control of such information, it makes the governments now vulnerable yeah, yeah. to the actions of these terrorist organizations. Three arguments coming from my side. I will analyze this and the angles of torture, hostage, and what happens when your life is no longer valuable. Point. Closing. Would you be in principle all right with killing human shields and civilians if it meant yeah. capturing a terrorist? Yeah. yeah. So, like, in the event where there are soldiers and we think that we need to capture these terrorists, we think we trade off the fewer lives at that position in order to save greater lives yeah. in the, um, the long-term situation of that conflict. Right. First argument. What happens to you when you are captured by terrorists? We think the immediate effect that will come to you is severe psychological and physical torture. How does this take place? We think oftentimes terrorist organizations, when they've taken capture of you, they take you to a remote area. And this could take place in jungles. So if you look at the FARC rebels or even in um, control areas controlled by these terrorist organizations like Raqqa or Mosul previously. The moment you are under their capture, you're put under a deprivation of food. You're isolated from any human contact. And the only time when you actually have human contact is when they put you in a position to extract information out of you. This means physically harming you to get information. And when that information does not come about or you fail to reveal the kind of information you want, they torture you by maybe beating you up or hanging you to the walls or drying you out in the sun for that matter. And we think the other step that they will take is to then attempt to heal you so that they could repeat all these things onto yourself. I think at this point, it is also preemptively speaking, yes, opposition may claim these soldiers are trained to deal with this situation, but we think given the human body and the vulnerabilities within it, there will come a point when you will break. When are these circumstances? We think after long periods of no hope or when you've actually taken the attempt to escape, but then recaptured back and brought back into these terrorist organizations. We think the human mind will then start to deteriorate and your ability to make conscious and rational decisions will no longer take place. We think at that point, killing yourself seems like the much more fulfilling uh, thing to do for yourself. No, thank you. No, thank you. Second argument. What is the power of a hostage within terrorist groups? We think the moment a civilian or a citizen of a country is captured and put in the position of a terrorist group, states are vulnerable. What does this mean? We think that when negotiations have taken place and when negotiations are drawn out for a long period of time, there is now pressure from society or pressure from your other citizens to succumb and to provide uh, monetary um, incentives to these organizations in order for them to release your terrorist groups. We think for 50 over years, the FARC rebels have been doing this when negotiating with the government of Colombia. I think this structurally empowers all the decisions that they make after that, like strategically detecting when we should um, capture individuals so that we gain money from the government to continue our tactics. We rather at this point trade off that one life 
if it means that we do not have to take out or fork out resources in order to continue that negotiation process or to continue saving your life. Because at this point, that is a process that it puts, puts the government in a very vulnerable position. But finally, what does this mean to you when you kill yourself? You think that the human dignity or your fulfillment, being able to control the outcomes of your death is extremely important here. If you look at the instance of Japan where samurai soldiers would take their lives the moment they realize that they are positions or because you are a mortal human being and there will come a point where you have to succumb and take your life away. We think these are principles that are consistent in this debate. The reason why it is best for you to take your life is because if you look at how terrorist organizations attempt to kill you, they behead you, they release videos, gory videos of that beheading onto YouTube, onto the internet, and that empowers a lot of the rhetoric to recruit individuals to join their terrorist groups. It also means that the, your families or yourself being positioned in such situations means there's very little dignity left to your death. At this point, it seems much more empowering to you as an individual, as a soldier, to take control of that narrative and to kill yourself. Because at the end of the day, you do not need to be put under such a long period of torture just because you want to protect military information. I think you do that far more better when you kill yourself instead. But finally, the conclusion to this is very simple. Controlling the narrative of your death is extremely important to soldiers when they are captured in these terrorist organizations, given the low chance of survivability um, for them, from like, the low chance of them forever accessing survivability, right? I mean, we think when you kill yourself and you remove this, you remove the asymmetry of power that terrorist organizations naturally have in terms yeah, of yeah. controlling you as an individual and controlling the, the, moral, um, the moral capacity of your country, right? Like seeing citizens of my country being beheaded and being killed and tortured naturally demoralizes the sentiments of a country and forces the country to take <coughs> severe actions. So we think that increases more collateral damage in the long run. We think that at the, at the end of the day, this debate prioritizes the individual life over, uh, prioritizes many more lives over the individual life. And we think if it means having to protect military secrets, if it means having to protect your country, we think that's a fairer world for us to live in. Let's be clear, this is not a debate about soldiers killing themselves. That's way too convenient a characterization for them to paint. What we're actually talking about is a Hannibal Directive that says that if a soldier is being captured, you are going to shoot him. As a comrade who has trained for hours with the individual, you will take a gun and end his life because you don't want military secrets to be revealed. This also means that when individuals are being held hostages in places like hospitals, where individuals or civilians on the ground are being used to shield these terrorists, you have absolutely no qualms whatsoever about bombing that specific building in in order to reduce the ability of these terrorists to use the hostages to negotiate with your state. That's what they have to defend. I think a large part of the PM speech is rendered irrelevant by the enforced slide of this particular debate. Understanding that this is the context that we are talking about, let's deal with several rebuttals that doesn't actually fit in to what I have to say. The rest of it will be integrated with my substantive. The first argument that we want to talk about is this idea of how killing yourself is empowering. Let's be clear. We don't mind or we don't care or we think soldiers should have the choice to kill themselves for the sake of their country if that is something that you wish to do. The difference is, the other side to defend, why is it that at the point at which the soldier does not, you will shame him for no longer being an honourable part of your army and completely dissociate and abandon all attempts to save the individual in the future. It also means that you're willing to bomb the areas in which these individuals are being held hostage and not pay or negotiate the terrorists at all in order to try to save them. Here's why this is destructive. It is not empowering to these soldiers. It is something that is the worst possible kind of choice that you tell them that they have to end their lives 
in order to be seen as honourable. We don't think it's a legitimate thing to force any individual, especially one that's dedicated their life to the army in your nation, to do. The second thing that we want to tell you about is why this actually worse off for the army as a whole. We think this negatively affects the morale of the army in a way that is particularly pernicious and problematic yeah. when it comes to fighting terrorism. The first thing we need to recognise is that this idea of a military secret is at best a red herring. Because the truth is that individuals recognise that it's impossible for you to ensure that all soldiers will always be killed at the point at which they are captured. That is why the military places a lot of store and a lot of time training individuals to deal with things like torture techniques as well as having lots of backup plans to be able to change their kind of tactics at a point at which anyone is caught where secrets may potentially be compromised. Yeah, like yeah. you said, over a long time a soldier may break, but a long period of time allows the military the flexibility to be able to change their tactics yeah. as a whole. But also, I want to deal with this argument that there's not an asymmetry of power between the military and the state, when, uh, sorry, between the terrorists and the state when it comes to negotiation. Who are you to determine what a state should prioritise when it comes to the lives of their own people, recognising that these soldiers are individuals that came from families and are the people of your state? How are, who are you to determine that the military or strategic advantage that comes about from killing these specific soldiers is something that individuals are willing to trade off in the compromise of the fight against terrorism? At a point at which your public can be swayed towards paying huge amounts of money for hostage negotiations or for swaps and trades. We think that's a legitimate decision and there's no such thing as a right decision in this cause because only what those individuals want that's considered something as legitimate. Why does this break the morale of the army? Recognize panel that the way that the army is trained, and I know about this because everyone in Singapore from ages of 18 like to 21 will just keep talking about it non-stop, is that you oftentimes spend your entire life with people that you see as your brothers. This doesn't proliferate upwards in the chain of command, but oftentimes exists within platoons themselves the strongest form of camaraderie that they have. They eat, they shit, they fight, they see death yeah, in this particular yeah. individual, yeah. and this person is something of a brother to them. Why is that problematic? Understanding that the Hannibal Directive is something that comes from the top down. We think this ruins the ability for the chain of command to be able to effectively be able to uh, uh, communicate with their soldiers. The first time an individual is being forced to shoot a person in their army and or shoot their brother and this is something the commander tells them to do so even though they wanted to continue to storm the areas where these hostages are held, held even though they are willing to go for more missions to try and save these individuals we think you ruin the kind of respect and camaraderie that exists between the chain of command. That's particularly problematic. Understanding the army requires you to have unquestioning obedience to the people who are above you in that chain. We need to prioritize and uh, 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 what's that word? balance the, kind, the, the morale and the camaraderie that these people feel with the fact that the chain of command has certain directives that they want to offer and we need to make sure those directives are not one that actively hurts the ability of the army to work as one unit. Yes. Um, but orders for you to die for your country uh, similarly come from top down as well but people internalize it as they build that camaraderie. Can you tell us why the principle of dying for your country can't be extrapolated into I need to make sure right. that I die There's in a huge order to save my country? Sure, sorry. sorry about that. There's a huge difference between you being willing to die with your brothers on the field and you being ordered, despite the fact that there may be the potential or ability to, for you to save that person in the future, to kill that person for no other reason than the convenience of the people that are in power. That is the difference in the psyche of this individual. Second thing that we want to bring to you is why we think there should be a culture of engagement with these individuals. Practically speaking, why is this problematic? Recognizing the Hannibal Directive is not just about the individual soldier themselves, but also about the civilians that you're willing to kill in your attempt to gain strategical advantages over these people. The first big point that we want to bring to you is that for the large part, individuals who are fighting against terrorists need to respect the rules of engagement in war, which attempts to prioritize the saving of lives as much as possible. The problem is, at a point where you show yourself to be willing to kill civilians or your own people in order to gain strategical advantages, you show yourself to be no better than the individuals they are fighting against. This has severe principal implications with regards to the culture of engagement and the rules of warfare that we are able to coerce or force countries to live by, to the extent to which we recognize the rules of engagement is largely a cultural thing. That at a point at which individuals no longer respect these particular forms of engagement, you lose the ability to make war something that's de-escalated. That means that violence and more um, worse tactics or more inhumane tactics are now suddenly legitimized given that you no longer seem to care about this culture of engagement as a whole. But the second problem is that we don't think this helps the war in any way. 
they will tell you that this gives you strategic advantages. But you know what gives people real strategic advantages and prolongs the war against terrorism? The losing of hearts and minds of individuals on the ground when they see that you, as an enemy, has no qualms whatsoever about killing their own people in order to gain strategic advantages in this specific area. You allow for these individuals to see you as the enemy because you are no better than the people they are fighting against. We think on their side, they further create recruitment strategies for these people through no other action but doing what they want, that policy that they wanted to do. In the comparative on our side, we think at a point where you respect these individuals, you show they are willing to engage with them, you paint these terrorists as the bad guy. When ISIS or like the Palestinians or any other terrorist group attempts to behead an individual that they have caught, they show themselves as being people who are willing to cross those lines of engagement. They show themselves as people who are willing to be inhumane. And if you look at the way that, for instance, people tend to detract support from Hamas every time they are overly violent over a long period of time, we think that as as long as these terrorists continue to carry out these forms of inhumane tactics and a misguided approach towards wanting to spread terror, they lose that support. We don't want to lose that support. We're happy to oppose. I think we're For someone who was informed of theatres of war, um, the opposition bench seemed to be very idealistic in the way in which they engage with the reality. Because let's look at the ultimate value of opening opposition case. They are principled, they are moral, but they will also be responsible for the death of a lot of innocent lives as a result of this terrorist organization being stronger, of information leaking out, and your military institution be weaker, your innocent citizens that you were swore to protect to be vulnerable. To those individuals, the leader of opposition just tells you that we were moral, I'm sorry for your loss. This opening government would not like to do that. I think, I'll be very honest, they probably did not include the list of people that Sherman wanted to talk about, but all of his principle still applies. Leader of opposition, literally responded to the entire of his speech, well, at least, you know, I responded to the entire speech, some parts, but all the principles still apply. What are those? Number one, like he told you, what happens in the, like, what happens in the immediate capture? You will be tortured. They say that, no, 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 these soldiers are trained. No. So the recent revelations showed us, or uh, some, some discovery showed us the way in which they torture is sick. They pull out your individual name, they stick a needle, they electrocute it. And then they pull out your teeth and they inject a needle and then they electrocute it. They allow your body to cripple and suffer. They allow a doctor to come in to recover you and then the torture will resume. This cycle of torture is something that no soldier is able to prepare. But coupled with the fact that someone is torturing your brother, your Apparently, if Dave and I was being captured. If you torture Dave in front of my eye, the moment you lay your fingers upon him, I will tell you where the base is, right? But I think this, this the emotional attachment and the biases shows the reason how people are susceptible to certain information, especially there's an exceptional camaraderie, like your family, uh, the reason why this kind of thing, this kind of information will leak. And he told you that why this information can't leak. Uh, this, we can't sacrifice this and tell that information will leak. We'll move around. This is the exact tactic that was employed by ISIS. ISIS was able to capture news reporters and use exceptional information to, cap to know where the bases are to fight against the rebels. This is what the Taliban did for many years. And this is what the, the, throughout the entire African continent, this is an exceptional tactic that they use. They skin you alive to make sure that I, I, you know that they are coming after you so that you will leak. And any leak, uh, any information, they will they, they will not ask you for the entire documentary, of course. They will ask you for any, any information. In some cases, they won't steal your uniform to, to, uh, to what do you call this, to, put, to portray yourself like another individual. The second thing he also told you, like what happens when you are not tortured. After torture, you might be used as a hostage. And then when you are used as a hostage, it's problematic right. because the state is literally giving infrastructure to terrorist organization to be stronger. This is what has been allowed, this is what has allowed the FARC rebel to be strong for over 50 years and are still strong, mind you, right? What does this mean? This means the point in which the FARC rebel is strong, the, 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 the one trade-off, the one individual that returns back to society is meaningless because the fact that the FARC rebel is strong means that they are able to carry out a lot of the violation on a 
bigger level, or the way in which they engage in which the terrorist organization will be a lot, uh, a lot worse. So this is not a necessary trade-off. The last thing he also told you is the way in which you control the narrative of your death. And this one was not engaged at all because you are going to die anyway. We would rather you take your life at the point. At the point at which, right, you you are no, no no longer able to control the way in which your body is being used as a terrorist propaganda. When you are being like you know beheaded in front of the national TV, right, you're, there will be uh, I don't know some rec uh, reciting, and, and there, you're forced to say some things, and you're beheaded. Your family gets to watch you suffer. They get to watch you bleed. I think the knowledge of someone's death is different than watching that person suffering. Seeing the body is different. The way in which you internalize that harm, you think you put through a lot of the family, not only family, the society, the Americans, when they watch this, and you put through them a lot more suffering in a short while. Like, on top of that, it is also a strategy in which the, the, the terrorist organization used to recruit more people. Yes. They tell you, this is how we get the infidels. This is how yes. we get the Americans. And this is what has been very successful because their ability to use an American life, to degrade the American life, shows strength. And that's what that's powerful. That's, so, that's why we would rather just you take your life and a lot of this harm does not accrue. Go. If it's true that people should have control of their death and do what is best in the name of their own dignity, would you be okay with a soldier not killing themselves, enduring all the torture because he thinks that's valuable to him? No. So I think the soldier should understand, and this is what the samurais used to do. They, take a, they have a short knife and a long knife. They kill themselves because they understand that mere mortals, at some point of your life, you would break. At some point of your life, you would lose control over your body and you would succumb. And that's the reason why you need to accept that your body right, might just be more harmful to your citizen and you owe duty. This, and this is where I'm nicely going to lead to my argument. Number one, what is the role of the soldier? These are people that have already traded their life to some extent, right? But the more important, their primary role is to ensure the most vulnerable people in society are being protected. The point at which you prioritize their emotional, uh, what do you call this, self, or your survival, survivability over someone else is extremely problematic, right? So, no, sit down. The second thing is that, of course, you've dedicated your life serving the army, but the army is not obliged to protect you if it means that you compromise the army itself. That's why, even in your world, you would leave a soldier, an abandoned soldier, even if you was brother, if it means that it will be an extreme amount of burden. Like there is no argument. You can't say that, oh, the military will be able to work around it. These are not instances where we can combat leader of opposition. These are instances where we have to make a value judgment. What is the value judgment they're willing to make? They will trouble them. They are, in, uh, according to what the leader of opposition said, they would carry this guy behind his back. Which means what? Because this existing life that is also being burdened, his ability to engage in the combat is also compromised. So he's, so what are the duties for a soldier during combat time? We think your duty is to engage and to cripple down some, uh, to, to cripple down the terrorist organization. The, po the point at which you have compounded yourself with exceptional amount of burden, it means that your ability to engage and solve the problem is also, uh, is also affected. The last thing we'd like to talk to you about in this debate is that civilians why are civilians like why, why are some civilians you can kill these civilians because number one there is no certainty that these civilians would live we would rather when we bomb those individuals we along with these civilians we bomb like the terrorist organization the specific technical individual that helped allow the prolong the continuance of this organization we would rather them die because we would rather some civilians die than and a plane to our uh, to our world trade center we would rather some civilian die, we will be unfortunate, right? But we would prevent the exceptional amount of collateral damage in ways we can't imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, they might be moral, they might promise you things, at the end of the day, the blood is in their hands, and the blood, they will never be washed, they will never be washed, they can't wash away for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you. I always laugh. Uh, wait, huh? Is this here? Oh, never use a MacBook, lah. That's fine. That's how you defend. <laughs> <laughs> If you are a state at war against terror, it is pivotal that your every action and rules of engagement reflect moral legitimacy. 
We think in that regard, the Hannibal Directive makes a state no different from a terrorist when you show a willingness to kill your soldiers and civilians, treating the Geneva Conventions with blatant disregard, treating all international conventions regarding rules of war with blatant disregard because somehow killing your soldiers is more important for your strategical advantage than the overall picture. The problem with Max's case, or like the entire OG's case, was that this debate was never just about strategical advantages. It was always about winning the battle of hearts and minds in order to then eventually win the, win the enemies. What they eventually do is enable recruitment of terrorist organizations when you show moral hypocrisy in your own actions as a state against someone who's supposed to be a morally illegitimate actor. When you are no different from a morally illegitimate actor, no one wants to support your cause. So let's just go straight into it, right? The first idea of how soldiers killing themselves may be <coughs> empowering, and that's something that is important in this debate. Shomei already told you how that's not, like, that may be a really, really blatant mischaracterization of what they were talking about, right? It is not true, because if you have a state executed directive that says you either kill yourself or someone else will kill you, will bomb you, that means that the soldier essentially has no choice On when that. thinking about that decision. It's not empowering because you don't control your death, it's something that was decided by the state for you without your consultation in the first place. There was never a choice given and if you don't do it, you're branded as someone who committed treason against the state, you're someone who was a traitor against the state and you will still eventually be killed. We think that that means that there was never an, like any form of empowerment within that death. What we're defending is sure, if soldiers do not want to undergo that torture, they have the individual right to always kill themselves. I, I guess you can carry your cyanide pill or your samurai sword or something like that. We think that that's okay. But it becomes a lot more pernicious when a state tells you that that is the only choice you have. And that's something that we're not willing to defend. We think that that's, that's where the state has to draw the line and say that if there is a possibility, even a small possibility or probability, that we may be able to save your lives, even if it means compromise we should be willing to fight for that life because your life matters, you have served the nation and we owe you that much. That's why Shomi's point was very important. We have to first on understand that. that the duty owed by the state to its soldiers is one that cannot right. be, you know, undermined by like the war against terror on the war against terror. Because firstly, let's understand that war, like recruitment is often voluntary in nature. That yeah. means that there has to be a will for people to want to enter the army. Camaraderie is important because you feel like you're fighting the good fight when you're fighting a war against terror. That drastically changes when, first of all, your nation's own like actions do, like undermine or are hypocritical to the war, like the just cause that you're supposed to uh, proposition in the first place. But second thing is that once there en enters a culture of mistrust within the soldiers, when you know that the state can eventually kill you because you may be so somehow compromised in certain state, that means that the camaraderie is lost and you know that the state may not be willing to defend you at all costs. Yes, soldiers opt into like battle with the idea of death or like understanding that there may be an instance of death but that death was always by enemy bullet that they consented to it was never by the state's bullet and that is a like the drastic difference that has to be made clear in this case as well the second thing is that this is also insulting to the soldier on some level because the assumption is that soldiers cannot be trusted on their own because they will eventually compromise information yes torture tactics may be like terrible, but let's understand that most of the time, first of all, states already train soldiers in dealing with torture On techniques. That. They never actually talked about that. Second, army protocol has always been to make sure that there's a shift in strategy once information is compromised. And the third thing is that most soldiers on the ground just don't carry enough valuable information to make them such a threat that your entire national security is going to be compromised because of one soldier. Point. Because most of the time, your generals are not on the ground. The people who cons like hold the most inform in uh, most important information is not on the ground. And that chain of command <coughs> always maintains the integrity of like secret information. So we don't think that that was ever the main cause of this debate. The main issue in this debate. So the main issue, and this is something I think the closing houses will talk about, is how right now most of your terrorist organizations like sort of use uh, use soldiers for psychological warfare, mainly taking soldiers hostage and then trying to like like publicize beheadings and stuff like that to eventually try to reduce the morale of the soldiers. Let's first recognize right. The first thing is that. You also reduce the morale of the soldier when you force soldiers to kill their own brothers in combat, right? And we think that that's something that happens and it's probably going to be a wash anyway. But the second thing, and this is something that was never rebutted by them, 
uh, is the culture of engagement <coughs> and how it should not be one that escalates violence before that. So don't you think it's far more dangerous, like you say, if during an open combat that soldiers feel that they might be exposed, might be vulnerable and in fact, the way they fight, if we think that their fellow soldiers are currently being tortured for information about their identity, position and strategy. Look, so this is why I, I said that, like, first of all, these soldiers do not usually hold enough important information to com like, compromise an entire security of a nation in the first case. But we think that like, even if that is the case, most of the time the military is fast enough to adapt. This, like, these are protocols that the military has like, time and again been ready to handle. Even when you had a snowden like, exposure of a lot of information, the military was able to enable that, like, that it was mitigated as well. We think that the military can do a lot more than to assure soldiers that they are in, like, uh, their security will be uh, guaranteed. Let's understand first the last thing then. Why we should not be able to escalate violence? The Hannibal Directive is one of is one that presupposes that we should never negotiate with terrorists and that we should always be hostile with our enemies. The truth is, negotiations happen all the time. It can include prisoner trades, it can include compromises, it can include backdoor dealings. But even if they don't, even if the trade-off is too too bad to make, we think that like the ultimate decision should lie in the hands of the state, considering the lives of the soldier, instead of just using the soldier, dehumanizing him as a pawn of the state to be like easily expendable when strategic like, <coughs> strategic influences may be undermined. I... That means that firstly, the hypocrisy of the state usually reduces the political capital and support for the state. Already, America is dubbed as a pseudo terrorist because it follows a lot of morally illegitimate tactics like torturing of its prisoners. We think that this further adds to that, like battle of hearts and minds being lost because people just think of America as no different from a terrorist. Therefore, it makes it incredibly harder for America, America to gain any like power from coalitions from other states who want to support the cause but do not like the actions that America is undertaking. We think that ultimately, the Hannibal Directive may be enticing because for, for some reason, you feel like your, your nation may be undermined. But we think that the battle of hearts and minds is best won on our side. For all these reasons, very proud to introduce. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Putting country beyond self is one of the most noble things I have ever learned in my life and I would never have been able to, ladies and gentlemen, imagine the amount of dedication, training as well, self-sacrifice that a person yeah, yeah. who has enrolled in the army would have to go through in order to say to themselves that I want to protect my country, I would like to fly overseas in some random distant land, go into a foreign situation, risk death every single day, ladies and gentlemen, through unknown threats beyond my imagination what could come in the next corner I turn around in my, in my vehicle. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the risk that they risk every single day. And the problem with the opposition in this debate is that they haven't distinguished first. Why is it that that risk is any sort of different, that self-sacrifice any different, the intent to put country beyond self any different in this particular <laughs> regard, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we propose in the closing government. A few things I'm going to look at in this debate, but the first thing is I think it's important for us to recontextualize the burdens of this debate, ladies and gentlemen, because this debate isn't a uh, government thinks that, you know, in all circumstances, we will just whack all the soldiers in any circumstance whenever there's a risk of them dying, ladies and gentlemen. This debate is specifically about the legitimacy of this tactic and whether we should keep this within the arsenal of tactics that we're able when we want to negotiate or even what we want to deal with certain individuals in society, ladies and gentlemen. We think the option existing makes all other options a lot more effective and a, a lot more available for us to not be taken advantage of when it comes to the unsavory <laughs> actors that you want on this side of the house. The first thing I want to do is say that it's quite unreasonable the characterization that happened in the opening opposition, as if we were going to bomb every single civilian site that existed in Situ just because we had one soldier there in that in that particular regard, and if that soldier has, like for example, he's a private, and then he's in a hospital, but no, we will bomb the entire, the entire city of Mosul, apparently to get the particular individual. Surely there must be a reasonable assessment in regards to the amount of information this particular individual has, 
versus ladies and gentlemen, the amount of damage that particular uh, instance of bombing will occur as well on that subhouse. The question is, if you find yourself in a position where a high-ranking, say, corporal is captured in his transfer from one city to another city, and fundamentally you have to say, for example, sacrifice five civilians or risk certain individuals dying, would you make that choice? Would you think sensibly, ladies and gentlemen, you would say that you wouldn't risk the thousands and thousands of individuals that might be risked, ladies and gentlemen, on that side of the house in that particular regard. Let's not fall into black and white dichotomies of like Mosul being bombed into obliteration on that side of the house. So reasonable assessments of necessity can be made in the closing government. The second thing I want to look at is even when you want to negotiate for now, let's assume that we want to negotiate in the starting points or let's assume that that's a, that's a thing that we want in this particular debate, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the question is, for two situations. First, is what happens when you can't bear the cost of the negotiation or the things that are claimed by these terrorist organizations? Because it's not just, ladies and gentlemen, that these people want information. Oftentimes, some of these people are asking for funds or concessions when it comes to the negotiations that exist in those particular <coughs> conflicts. Things like uh, removing your soldiers from those particular areas in order to give them more breathing room. Things like giving tens of millions of dollars that, for example, in 2014, ISIS asked for $14 million and $15 million for Japanese hostages that came onto their land. And ladies and gentlemen, those were the amounts that we were talking about when it comes to hostage taking when it just was ISIS. Ladies and gentlemen, in those circumstances, some states or some militaries aren't able to bear the cost first. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, that's a, that presents a high degree of morale, da da damaging morale in that particular regard. And also foreign policy objectives are being harmed when you're making those sort of concessions. But the second scenario I want to look at very importantly is what happens when there's a repeated showing of bad faith on the part of the terrorists. Yeah, because yeah. the alternatives on the opening opposition, why do we negotiate or tupper, die? They all will just, you know, we'll just leave them to die in that particular circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, in the instance where you have repeated showing of bad faith, we need to be able to deter them in some circumstance by saying at some point, we'll stop negotiating with you and we say you are able to take more and more terrorists in that particular regard. We can't keep giving you $14 million and then you kill that hostage at the end of the day anyway. But the second level to that, ladies and gentlemen, which is very important, is that when it comes to repeated showing of bad, bad faith on that side of the house, we also think that oftentimes terrorists take hostages in order to create the propaganda they're talking about. It's specifically like Shirley says, that the propaganda of cutting off people's heads isn't as flippantly ineffective as they say on that side of the house for several reasons. Because the popularity of ISIS isn't the fact that they hid that they were brutal to their followers and people that were sympathetic to them to begin with. People that are, are sympathetic to ISIS know that they are brutal and think it's legitimate. The only concern was whether or not they thought ISIS could beat their enemies or not, whether they were strong yeah, yeah. enough to win that war. But showing, ladies and gentlemen, in the asymmetric war, that you're cutting off the heads of corporal or for example, uh, privates of those particular armies are uh, exorbitant showing of strength when it comes to propaganda online and shows more recruitment for people who are already sympathetic to that cause. That's why we needed more analysis as to why you wouldn't be able to recruit more. That's why the height of ISIS recruitment in 2014, 2015 was at the point of release of all the behaving videos of journalists and military officers on that side of the house. But before I go any further, uh, uh, give closing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Americans feel better when they watch ISIS kill off Americans or when Americans kill off their own friends. Uh, yes, I'm going to get to that. I say Americans when they kill Americans, ladies and gentlemen. That's the clash, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the propaganda, not only does it affect, for example, ladies and gentlemen, propaganda and more recruitment for the individual, we think we sufficiently beat the argument in the opening opposition. But secondary, ladies and gentlemen, is also we think that number one, it creates fear when it comes to voters back home when they see James Foley getting beheaded, ladies and gentlemen, voting for people who are more hawkish when it comes to their uh, foreign policy, making irrational decisions. It could go either way. It's either you pull out of a state because you're, you're, you fear your family members being beheaded and that visceral image in front of you, or similarly on the other side, which is equally as likely, they become more aggressive, that you invade countries, you be more brutal in that particular regard. That behavior also translates into, for example, people in the army and how they treat other individuals as well. It's not as simple as, say, demoralization like the opening opposition talks about, but further extends to things like brutal treatment of Arabs when it comes to the uh, villages that you visit. Things like raping villages because you think that they're dirty, they hurt your brother and things like that, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the circumstances that are created when you have brutal, visceral images of propaganda, of beheadings and t torture that occurs on this, this side of the house that's prevented at least when we ensure that no hostages or less hostages are taken on the closing 
government. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that people are more likely, ladies and gentlemen, in this instance where you are bred in a culture where you're already told that putting country beyond self is important, that the unit serves the state and, uh, and the innocent alike, ladies and gentlemen, that you are exposed to the visceral images of propaganda, of people getting beheaded, being tortured every single day, that it could be dragged on for years or months, ladies and gentlemen, versus the, the immediate, quick, albeit unfortunate, ladies and gentlemen, shooting of that person. People will be angry with us shooting a fellow fellow soldier, but it won't be dragged out for months, plastered all over the internet, and ensure that people are regurgitated of the imagery every single time they visit the internet. That comparative is certainly better under our side of house. We would save more lives, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, we have to sacrifice a few. Thank you. This debate has sorely lacked an explanation of what the impacts are of having camaraderie, or the impacts are of having hearts and minds in this world. We agree with the open opposition that it would decrease the recruitment, maybe it will decrease the harm, but I say there are actual benefits to having soldiers who know soldiers are behind their backs and knowing that the institution of a military will always be on your side, will not trade goals for a human life. Before I go to any of that, I'm going to do a closing government. Essentially, in their speeches, they made two claims. Number one, if we stop negotiating with terrorists, we stop placing a life on captured soldiers, this will mean terrorists are less incentivized to do this, and therefore there's a benefit on their side. The first thing I will say is, that's not going to happen. In a world where capturing soldiers or capturing individuals is the only method, there's no alternative for them to inflict pain. The only alternative is beheading, hurting them, like brutalizing and like showing them on YouTube. I don't understand why it's a disincentive because it's either they do this or do nothing. So even if it's ineffective, they will do it anyway. But the second thing I will say as a result of this is recruitment actually will be worse in your world. Note that the premise of this extension was that less beheading will happen in the world of government. That's not true. In a world where they have no incentive or maybe negotiations, no incentive for a captured soldier to return. They will brutalize, hurt okay. this person, behead that person, and show it because they have nothing to lose. So actually, recruitment will be worse in your world. Actually, there will be more YouTube videos in your world because they have nothing to gain from the United States of America. They have all reason to go out okay. against them. So in your world, you have more inhumane tactics. In your world, you have more beheadings, and recruitment will become far worse. Therefore, okay. your contingent argument, okay. having seen about individuals reacting more viscerally, the American public become worse off, actually becomes worse in your world. So actually, we would rather Rather negotiate with terrorists, so they have something to lose or something to gain. Therefore, they don't have an incentive to kill these people. So I think closing governments out in that sense. But the second thing they say in this debate: don't heckle, sit down. Is that bravery and camaraderie happen in both worlds? You would love as a soldier to trade off your life because anyway, you're dying for your country. Um, let's just first talk about this. This is about what your values as a soldier. In the world of the government, you are dispensable. In the world of the government, your goal is prioritized over the human life. Therefore, the value will be not placed on the soldier, but on the goal that was achieved. In our world, the soldier is indispensable. You try to save the soldier. You didn't want to trade off his life. I think the bravery is different. But the second thing is, I'll contest that soldiers go into the military for bravery and this whole hoo-ha about the American dream. They often do it for the fact they don't want to up the military scales. They often want to get high positions of power. I don't think this bravery is actually very important. But the third, the point which your life is always at risk. I think a soldier would not be brave and more likely to opt out of the military and not join in your work because they are going to lose their lives. I would think that in your world, they won't enter risky operations. They won't enter into cities. They won't enter sieges that they know. They might get captured because if everything goes south, I'm the first one to fall, even if my missions don't succeed. So closing our governments out of this debate. Have you seen Max? In relation to the opening, I want to say two things. Number one, how valuable is this intel? I agree with the opening of that this information literally invaluable because soldiers don't get access to it. But we'll go further. If it's true that this intel is valuable, we will trade off this intel because in our world, more people will support us. More locals will be more likely to give us information. The people that you are bombing in hospitals, the individuals who are literally in cities where they are ISIS supporters but are hidden, those people give us intel. That intel is more relevant. That intel is more likely to win us the war. That intel is one that is actually the most evolved version. So we will trade off the intel of the soldiers for the evolved versions we will get in our So great, we don't actually care about the intel. Second is about this value of life of the soldier. I asked in a POI, would you allow that soldier to keep himself alive? They say no. So you are actually placing a standard for their value of life. It's just which standard would we prefer? I would say I would rather that soldier be tortured and maybe escape. It's the possibility of escaping that is actually valuable. Because in your world, it's literally 
that the person cannot escape. But on top of that, it's not just the soldier that is captured. It's all the other soldiers that are maybe thinking they might get captured. Those people won't enter the battlefield. Those people are more likely to avert from risk. And as a result, even if that one soldier is a person that you will give the dignity to, your whole military operation is gone. Hey, why? Because people don't enter operations. They want to. So really, opening government, there's no value in this human life element of suicide. Right. Before I go on my extensions, I'll take one. Um, so earlier in the response to us, you tell us that there will be more YouTube videos created, more yes. hostages, and apparently all the harm that we talked about will not occur. But how are all those things going to occur when I number one, there's an expectation that the hostages will be shot, or you don't get those hostages to miss those videos to begin with? No, no, dude, I literally just explained why there's always an incentive to continuously take the number of soldiers away, because one less soldier in the military is a benefit for you, so that doesn't change the calculus of a terrorist. But second, when there's no incentive to negotiate and the release of the soldier is a possibility, you have all the incentive to behead and make it as brutal as possible, so it's a ratio on that comparison. Okay. Let's talk about extensions. I want to do two things in this debate. Number one, talk about the in-ground army and war strategies that will be harmed as a result of camaraderie. And second, do an analysis on local support and local operations. In my extension, let's first talk about what the value is of camaraderie. Like, I agree with the opening that it's a good thing and like Singapore has done a brilliant job at it, but it leads to actual tangible things. Number one, in your world, you will have less soldiers opting in. That means on a net, there will be less people to carry operations that require numbers, taking in sieges, being able to gather information, being able to take a okay. over a city requires huge numbers that you will lose in your world. But the second thing I will say is you are also okay with shooting people in hospitals and journalists. Yeah, it can be proportional, but you're going to do it anyway. There will be less journalists in your world, less people that are instrumental in increasing information about the war, increasing the support for the United States government. All those people will be lost in your world. This means that an increase in number of enemies dead doesn't equate to winning the war, but rather is further away from winning said war. But the second thing I will say is okay. if you don't enter risk your Operations. Even your people are more risk averse, so just know that they have no one to back them up. Either one, they are more likely to ruin the operation, but two, they are literally complicit in more propaganda. The fact that you can point your American soldier as disloyal is a reason why you empower terrorists in your world. But the second, in terms of hearts and minds, like we agree we will in our world have lesser recruitment for ISIS because uh, people have more trusting of the United States government, but it goes further. First thing we will say is, as a result of this conflict, more people will support the United States' information or involvement in state war. This means that post-conflict, you have a state that is more trusted, less reason for people to rebel against this state state, less reason to go back into civil conflict, less reason for you to do not disclose information and intel. We will think it's instrumental in preventing like Iraq, right, where we had to remove a government, remove and replace them. ISIS became stronger. I would say that post-conflict, even if you win the war, you would have less support by the state. You quit because you're willing to trade off people on the ground as a result of it. So we say in the long term, you might win the war, but you will lose everything in that scenario. War is more likely to perpetuate. What's the comparison? We agree it's prologue. We agree we probably might not win that war. But if that means that less people in our world feel a need to join the opposition, feel less of a need to hide intel, and as a result, escalate a violence in your world, then maybe winning the war isn't the end goal. It's actually to prevent harms that accrue. I'm supremely proud to oppose. <laughs> But all the sacrifice of a soldier is great and very often necessary. The death of the soldier is more about who they die for rather than the bullets that kill them. Yeah, we think yeah. it's important that they die for country to save their comrades, civilians, and state, and we think that is moral. But firstly, there are a few things we don't understand from side, from side closing opposition. 
right? Because they said that now we have more videos worse of torture tactics and a lot worse of and more extreme ways of dealing with their victims. But realize that the Hannibal directives and the legitimate tactic that we're literally talking about is to prevent that from happening, is to shoot that individual to ensure that they don't get tortured in all those horrible ways that you don't want them to torture. I mean, this is those one rare moment that not about a scale. It's literally about a binary. So all these victims are meant to not exist and meant to be killed off. We think it's a more dignified way of us dealing with this situation. So how is it, let's first deal with how is it harmful for the state. We think both OO and CO fail to recognize the foreign policy implications, but even worse of CO who literally didn't want to deal with any implication at all. Yeah. We told you about the visceral impact of beheading your fellow Americans. And then that means that it leads to brutal treatments of people who are like Arabs and individuals like that. That means that it creates a lot more xenophobia, Islamophobia that's impacted and created by this videos and further perpetuated by organizations like ISIS who benefit from all of this xenophobia because they're able to isolate people like them away from Americans or away from people from uh, the Western countries. We think it creates a huge victim complex and us versus them uh, attitude that ultimately reacts and creates very, very bad foreign policies at the end of the day. We don't think either one of them was ever able to react to such visceral impact. We think it's very different when it comes to people understanding that it's far easier for you to understand that if an American shoot another American, it's far more likely for you to give them the benefit of the doubt. It's an extremely necessary situation. It's far less likely for you to be angry at a particular soldier. But when a, an Arab or for example someone from ISIS kills your fellow Americans, you give them absolutely no benefit of the doubt and you react in a completely unreasonable and angry manner which those enrich create that all those anger creates bad foreign policy on their side. Okay. So thank you. Let's talk about the hearts and minds of individuals. Because this was literally CO's extension, but maybe we thought it already came from opening opposition. But how soldiers will leave, and now we have no soldiers, and no one will fight the war, and we lose the war. A pretty huge jump, but never mind. Let's talk about it, right? They say that soldiers don't want to take the risk and things like that. But it seems very patronizing in the way they speak of soldiers, as those soldiers were all kept in a battlefield that was always ideal to begin with, and never had to deal with any form of risk before this policy. Soldiers often Often, we have to deal with situations where they have to abandon positions or most times have to come and deal with suicidal missions. So most of those things are expectations and trainings that soldiers have to go through most of the time, right? And we think that this means that we would lose a huge bunch of soldiers that are suddenly disheartened by the fact that potentially they could die for a greater cause. We think soldiers, most of them have already accepted that the moment they realize that they have to go and be posted at places like Afghanistan or Syria yeah, is a yeah. risk that they understand. We don't think you significantly reduce the hearts and minds of the soldiers. But what could reduce the heart and potentially make them feel fear and paranoia? When they realize that potentially the, in, the visceral effect over months and months, if the fear was indeed created, would potentially be a lot worse. Because if they see ISIS continuously torturing, or you see that video online, it reminds you of the strength of ISIS towards every individual soldier as well. And we think it's a lot more painful given that those soldiers are in open combat and we think that that's worse. No, thank you. We also think it's dangerous if these soldiers uh, responding to opening opposition that these soldiers believe that or worry that the person that's being kidnapped or being tortured could give up information whether or not that person actually give up information. Yeah, yeah. This means that soldiers are worried about whether or not this current strategy is the most updated strategy. Did they take into account information that was taken away from a person when a person was tortured? It doesn't matter whether the soldier that was being tortured or kidnapped actually gives up information, yeah, yeah. but if soldiers believe that that is a possibility, they might be worried during open battle and might have a lot more fear and paranoia due to the fact that they think they don't have control over information anymore. Before that, yes. Earlier, you said that you don't bomb every single hospital and civilians in it and that's how you will win the battle of hearts and minds. But it seems to be that in your policy, you need to kill every single soldier that's captured in order to ensure that no viscerality and videos can ever be made. Look, we think that we don't think that every soldier uh, at that point in time will always get kidnapped. We'll have a hundred over soldiers getting kidnapped. We don't think it's a very, very easy thing 
to do. But most of the time, when those soldiers are being kidnapped, we're happy to shoot them in order to ensure that you create confidence in the soldiers in order for them to know that it's far more important that the strategic position of the soldier, strategic position of the state is not being given up, and the, the state are able to carry out their foreign policy effectively. We think that's far better. We don't think this leads in a massacre of your own soldiers, but it does lead in the death of some of your soldiers. And we think that's necessary and we're happy to subsume that harm. We're, we think we talked about that already. No, thank you. But we think that throughout the debate, we don't think that they are able to fundamentally talk about recruitment in a positive way. Because the recruitment from ISIS on their side isn't about people on the ground or people in Syria and Iraq and Iran feeling afraid of the soldiers of America, but more about whether or not they feel that ISIS is strong in that place. So their confidence for ISIS is oftentimes misplaced because of the show of weakness of soldiers from America when they're able to take in these individuals hostage and are able to kill them or able to torture them in front of videos and things like that. This means that this misplaced confidence by people who are worried and paranoid actually leads to the further recruitment of members of ISIS. We think that's a very important thing that they didn't respond to. Yeah, so we think that they cannot just very simply tell us the recruitment of ISIS is just about who they hate more, but it's more about the confidence that they have as to who is more powerful. And we think it's very, very important. At the end of the day, we think closing government have been able to tell you very importantly that this very, uh, very importantly affects the way in which foreign policy works, the way in which you create either racist or very, very hateful policies that ultimately breed and creates more terrorist organizations like ISIS, isolate individuals, as well as you lose the hearts and minds of soldiers on their side. We're extremely proud to propose. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The targets on our backs are painted by terrorists, but the arrow that shoots was shot by our friends. It's funny, a bullseye is starting to look a lot like the American flag. This is where Amrit's extension was important that Jasmine failed to really re bring down or rebut. I will then move on to like lives out somewhat of an extension and then opening government's case. But let's look at uh, the extension that came from closing opposition that was unique and brought and grounded this debate in actual impacts rather than the fluffy ideas of camaraderie and uh, bravery on closing government. So let's look at what Amrit truly said. Because the end goal that closing opposition won, always wanted was clear. That we always wanted a better ability to fight the war and give soldiers that, that advantage within the war. Their war is one that where soldiers know they are in, that they are dispensable. So Jasmine tells you that you are afraid and you're more afraid of torture and capture from terrorists. We think that that is true. People are afraid of torture and capture, but now you're also afraid about of your fellow soldiers, right? We, uh, so Amrit told you that when you have this mentality, that you genuinely believe that you are dispensable, that, that the government is willing to uh, wash you off, or your friends are willing to shoot you, and, and you must be willing to shoot your friends. This means a worse off ability to go into risky uh, risky or more like effective military tactics, right? This means that when it comes down to actually going in a, con a, con in a contingent into your, uh, into certain battlefields that may be more secluded or more risky, yeah. you know that a lot of soldiers would specifically opt out of that or would push their other friends to go forward First, we think that a lot of people yes. who have already have PTSD, who are already afraid, wouldn't opt in to your so-called bravery. But I would also specifically told you why their intel that so, was so important in opening government is not enough in comparison to the new intel yeah. and the specific nuanced intel that, that comes up to date on the ground from people on the ground, right? This means that when you do, you may lose out on like all the intel from uh, soldiers that have been captured, which you can tell. You know which intel has been taken away from yeah. you. you, you trade off the ability to get people who are uh, people on the ground to actually give you newer intel right this means better abilities to go into certain trade uh, certain routes that a lot of terrorists use then now because a lot a, a lot of civilians on the ground in that war know that you're willing to kill your friends what more me I want more a civilian a middle eastern civilian do you think they're actually going to give you better intel now we don't think so but I'm also specifically told you how you have better support during 
post conflict as well, right? So we, if, yeah. even if they win the war, which we don't think it's likely, like even if you win the war, the post conflict is one where nobody can, will trust the uh, the Western government, right? If the Western government is willing to kill their friends, we a lot a lot of these governments, a lot of these like post conflict zones will never trust you in transition governments, right? This is like Afghanistan, right? So like like the fact that America went all guns are blazing in there right now is all in turmoil. The reason why ISIS happened was because America failed to like actually neutralize Al Qaeda. We think that that's problematic. Uh, that's problematic in the post conflict zone that they. One, right okay. but we tell you also that I'm, I'm told you also that every number you kill is literally a win for a terrorist and this yeah. means that you lose out in numbers on your own and like terrorists actually win because you're literally killing your own comrades before i move on uh to closing government opening up the reason why co's extension is less relevant today is because because it's post only conflict consideration right is the reason why 50 years the FARC rebel has not been taken down and america is still fighting the afghanistan iraqi war answers those people and the lives lost there the fact that you are going to shoot your comrades it means that you literally don't exhaust all these things like negotiations all these like peace yeah. politics that literally means that the FARC rebels are more peaceful now whereas on your side you these FARC rebels will be even more radicalized i don't think you're going to get a post conflict so at least, uh, at least we think that if that regardless of how the war turns out we'll get a support during the war post conflict war and also for future wars in uh, future yeah. wars right but let's look at closing government because they are Goal, they are as twofold, and the first thing that they tell us is that they want less ISIS propaganda because they think that like our videos and like propaganda is a horrible thing. There's a reason why Amrit told you specifically that there'll be more videos is twofold. That number one, knowing that they can't use cap, uh, the news at this capture, uh, be capture people for like information. They know that these people are going to kill themselves. It's why they'll like take videos immediately killing these people in the most brutal way possible. If they know they cannot hold that person and behead that person, it means literally sending bombs into that or like uh, becoming even more brutal in the ways okay. that they show and shoot these videos. Well, worse off, you literally limit the chances of survivability yeah. because they know that they will, their target is to kill you straight off rather than capturing you for a video. So, but here's where we also think that Americans, uh, Americans like, that they'll also decide that Americans will kill themselves anyway, right? And this is a powerful tool and a powerful video to show, right? Yeah. If I can show a video literally of an American soldier killing another American soldier, this shows weakness, this shows that they're not willing to fight, this shows that yeah. literally the ISIS is st as strong as you say they are. That's not the, and the second end goal that like that came from closing government, right? Because they, they tell you that number one, uh, people join for bravery. What a lie. People join because they're literally poor. People join because they want to climb out the ranks like Amrit told you, right? But even then, is it good for people to claim that killing yourself and killing your comrades is a brave thing to do? We don't think so. We think that the moment your this is in your arsenal, it literally means that you don't exhaust the other things within your arsenal. You know, this blind glory means that people will do this specifically without like going in to save your men, uh, save your men, right? We think that Americans on the ground, regardless of how, whether or not this is brave, people on the ground will see that you weren't brave enough to save my brothers. You weren't yeah. like, brave enough to save my father in that war. But they think like really quickly with opening government. Because you know, their end goal was twofold also. That like it is maintaining military secrets. We don't think that that information is as important as the better information that we have yeah. on our side. Now, worse off, even if they maintain mil like military secrets, they don't maintain military numbers. Just specific to our side, every person you kill is one more person, uh, like that one more, well, one less person to fight the actual fight. But that, the, even like in terms of protecting civilians, because they don't want them to watch torture, it's even more torture to watch a coffin coming back to my house. No, it's even more torture to know that my father is dead, and it's even worse to know that my father is dead because of his friends because of someone i respected rather than the than isis right we think that these are these are things that are irreconcilable and that they make it a lot worse off for people on the ground the government side is one that is going to be ruthless and have no qualms in killing their friends I didn't do